You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. I've got a lot of open tabs on my laptop. Because when I see a story, I might want to talk about it at the top of the show. I leave the tab open. I don't get to all of them. Others don't rise to the level of top of the show rant. So lots of open tabs on my computer that I'm closing today. Because I'm cleaning house. Closing tabs left and right. Because, well, that torn rotator cuff I've mentioned once or twice or 3,000 times now is getting reattached on Thursday. It's going to be a bumpy few weeks for me. Next week, you're going to find out what the top of the show sounds like when I am on powerful painkillers. That should be fun. You're going to want to tune in for that. But I wanted to face next week with at least a cleaned up computer and no open tabs. So closing tabs. First tab I'm closing is an open tab for an episode of The Gist. That's Mike Pesca's podcast. I didn't want to rant about something Mike said. I don't have anything to say about something Mike said. I always learn from what Mike has to say. I left the tab open because I thought I might want to talk about an ad that appeared at the top of that episode of The Gist. I subscribe to The Gist now, so I don't hear ads at The Gist anymore, but I can't subscribe to every podcast, and I keep hearing this ad on other people's podcasts. Now, I don't want to advertise a company that isn't advertising on my show, but I might have to to talk about this ad, there is this company. It's a website that helps people find contractors to do home repairs or remodels. And it recently changed its name from Angie's List to Angie for reasons. Reasons I still don't quite understand despite having heard the ad that supposedly explains why the company changed its name at least three or 400 times. The ad opens with a few characters, voice actors speculating about the name change. And it is a diverse group of voices. I thought it was an eco move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. So, first a woman who sounds vaguely African American, a guy who sounds vaguely straight and white, and then a woman at the end who sounds straight and white. But that third voice... Let's just hear that no again. No, it's to be more iconic. That's a gay guy. That's a gay voice. I'm inferring that not from a context clue. Yes, gay men are obsessed with icons who go by one name. Cher, Madonna, Beyonce, Rihanna, Charo, Yarnell from Shields and Yarnell. But that guy, that actor, he sounds gay. There's a whole documentary about the gay voice. Do I Sound Gay? David Thorpe's documentary. I was interviewed for it. I'm in it. I know a gay voice when I hear one. Most of us do. And every time I hear that ad, and I hear it a lot, I wonder how the audition went. Hey, we need a guy who sounds, you know. No, I don't know, says the casting director. You need a guy who sounds what? We need a guy who sounds like a middle-aged white male Swifty fan. And then they cast the guy, and how many takes did the actor need to nail that perfect gay no? I can hear the director after the first take saying, okay, that was a good take, and then saying the same after the third take, but can we try it again and make it just a little bit more, you know, give us that special combo of lilt, vocal fry, and calloused tonsils? No. All right, that's perfect. Perfect. Another open tab I'm closing. Robert Jones, age 78, died of a cardiac event aboard a celebrity cruise earlier this year. According to a report I read in USA Today, the cruise had six more days to go, and the family could have disembarked with the body in Puerto Rico and flown home. But there were six more days to go, and they'd paid for the cruise already, and they were told there was a morgue on board the ship. So no need to cancel the family vacation just because Grandpa died. But the plot twist, the ship's morgue, and yeah, a big cruise ship has a morgue with 3,000 passengers and 1,200 crew members. That cruise ship, that celebrity cruise ship, is a small city, and people drop dead, fall overboard, and contract deadly viruses and shit themselves to death every day on cruise ships, which is why the one time I was offered a free cruise, I said, no. Anyway, the morgue was out of order, so celebrity cruise ship employees improvised stuffing Mr. Jones' body into a body bag and then stuffing that body bag with Mr. Jones' body in it. 
into a beverage cooler with the margarita mix and the frosés and the Bud Light. And as it turns out, a beverage cooler isn't actually cool enough to stop a body from decomposing. So by the time the ship docked six days and however many trips to the buffet later, Mr. Jones had decomposed, swelled up, turned green, which denied the family, according to a lawsuit filed by the family, the comfort of an open casket funeral. I'm Catholic. We have open casket funerals. I was dragged to a lot of them as a child, and I gotta say, they're not a comfort. Not comforting. Disconcerting. Open casket funerals are a disconcert. So, six extra days on board, all those buffets, a closed casket funeral when you get home. At least the younger members of the Jones clan, they came out ahead. One last tab I want to close, the Nursing and Midwifery Council or Midwifery Council of New South Wales, which is a quasi-governmental body, sent out an email to nurses in New South Wales warning them not to start OnlyFans accounts or to close OnlyFans accounts. They might have started because nurses with OnlyFans accounts were bringing the profession into disrepute. Now, Nurses in New South Wales are currently striking to raise their wages. Wages have been stagnant for nurses for years as inflation has been eating away at their incomes. And of course, Australia has socialized medicine, so nurses are paid by the state. And some nurses in New South Wales were doing what they needed to do, what they had to do to make ends meet when they started their OnlyFans accounts. So yeah, Maybe a government that pays nurses so poorly that some are doing sex work on the side, not for fun, not just for a little mad money, not because it's something they've always wanted to do for themselves or fantasized about doing and get off on doing, something that they're doing, starting OnlyFans accounts because they have no choice. Maybe that government is bringing itself into disrepute. All right, all my tabs are closed now. We can start the show. Coming up on the micro, tons of your cues, lots of my A's. And Dr. Debbie Herbenick joins me to talk about exercise-induced orgasms, which are a thing on the micro. And then on the Magnum Savage Lovecast, which you can subscribe to at savage.love, more Savage Lovecast, more Savage Love, bonus podcast events, and no ads, Jolenta Greenberg, comedian, author, and co-host of How to Be Fine, joins me to talk about self-help culture, stinky dicks, real housewives, and more. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Talkspace, online therapy that makes it easy to get extra mental health support. For $100 off your first month, go to talkspace.com and use the offer code SAVAGE. Support for today's show, support we are very grateful for, comes from Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, you can access all the amazing services of the post office right from your desk, in your own home, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just click, print, mail, and you are done. It could not be easier. And right now, use Savage for this special offer. Includes up to 55 bucks worth of free postage, a digital scale, and a four-week trial. Do not wait. Go to stamps.com and before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in savage. That's stamps.com. Enter S A V A G E. Hi, Dan, and the tech savvy at rescue. I am a woman in her late 20s, finally getting around to figuring out her sexual orientation and needs and desires after being married to a man for five years. Ever since I admitted to myself that I liked women, which was about four years ago. It's been a slow build for me. It started to become all I masturbated to, and I needed to imagine women during when my husband and I had sex. But I also really loved my husband, and I felt like he was strong, and I enjoyed fucking him. I just like needed to have fuck a woman first <laughs> uh, to be in the mood to fuck him, I guess. And I finally kind of came out to myself and I came out to my husband as bi and that ended up being like a non-conversation and I realized that I wanted to have a bigger conversation and really explore that and I was preparing to say that to him but in the meantime in the background our marriage had hit a really rough patch 
I was feeling lonely and disconnected and like I was too much. I met a woman and a friend who really validated me and was a great support. And I could be a support for her. And I started crushing on her. And I acted on that, which I deeply regret and has caused my whole life to feel like it's exploding because that experience made me question by and didn't fit anymore, made me feel so gay. It was, felt so right. And I didn't need to be anywhere else but where but right there. And like when I have sex with my husband. And that made me just want to cut and run and be with her and figure out my shit. But that doesn't feel fair and that doesn't feel fair to my husband, who is just finding all this out and or the commitment that we made to each other. But I don't know how to figure myself out within our marriage. And I don't know what to do about my crush. <laughs> I don't know if I need to let her go and figure this out with my husband and how oh, there'll be more women or if I can <laughs> include her in this process. I just don't know what to do. I don't know who I am and what I want and where to go to figure that out. Seems to me that you have figured yourself out and that's the problem. What you don't know how to do is figure yourself out within this marriage because there's no figuring for you in your marriage. You now know that you are a lesbian. And so your marriage is based on a lie, not quite a lie, not a lie told with malicious intent. Like a lot of lesbians, you came to the realization later in life, like a lot of lesbians, and this seems to be true to the lesbian experience even still. You only realized that you were a lesbian after having sex with men, after marrying a man that is common to the lesbian experience, even still, even in these days when people are coming out younger and younger. All right, so you got married in your late 20s. You've been married for five years which means you got married in your early 20s. And I'm going to assume you didn't get married at first sight, which means you began dating your husband in your very early 20s. Maybe you weren't even quite 20 yet when you began dating your husband. So you never gave yourself, you never felt entitled to give yourself the time and the space really to figure out who you were authentically, sexually, and romantically. And now you have. And what do you do? When you say, I can't figure out myself within my marriage, what I hear you saying is, how do I stick this dismount? How do I exist as the person that I know that I am without hurting my husband? And I'm sorry, you can't. What you want to do now is minimize the unavoidable hurt that you're going to inflict on your husband, that this circumstance that was really inflicted on you, you know, you didn't write the cultural script that pounds it into women's heads, that men are their only option, that lesbianism or bisexuality isn't someone or something that they could be or are or should have. Women often, because something maybe about something to do with female sexuality, maybe something to do with the way women are socialized, maybe some self-reinforcing combination of those two things, women often have a harder time figuring out who they are, what they want, who they are when it comes to sexual orientation, what they want out of a relationship, what their kinks might be. I often say that, you know, boys arrive at partnered sex you know, when they have partnered sex, increasingly young men aren't having partnered sex. Experts in their own orgasms, fully consciously aware of what their fantasies are, what their kinks are, what and who they are, what and who they want. And often it's the case that women have to spend years excavating who they are and what they want out from under the expectations that were heaped up on them about what they should be and what they should want. And if you've entered into a marriage, if you've scrambled your DNA together, which it doesn't sound like you have, thank God, by the time you realize who you are, what you want, maybe by the time you realize who you are, what you want, you will be married, coincidentally, luckily enough, to 
who you wanted to be with and a person who is a good partner for you is what you want. But all too often, which is why this is common still to the lesbian experience, all too often a woman who digs herself out from under the layers of crap the culture socialization have heaped up on her, finds that she's prematurely made a commitment to someone. And it's not the right someone. Sometimes it's someone of the wrong sex or gender. Sometimes it's someone of the, you know, a sex or gender that this woman is attracted to, but not the right person from that pool, that sex and gender pool. So what do you do? Well, now that you know, you didn't tell any active lies to your husband when you met. You fell in love with him. Now that you know, who you are, you love your way into this marriage, you're going to have to, as hard as it's going to be, love your way out of this marriage. Be honest, finally, with him and be honest with yourself about what's possible. And I'm sorry, you're in your late 20s. It's not possible for you to spend 50, 60 more years in a marriage that was a mistake. And so I don't think there's this other woman. I don't think you rush out of the relationship you're in now and into a relationship with this other woman. I think it's fine if you want to date her. But right now, while you unwind the premature commitment that you made to your husband, a commitment you made before you knew who you are, don't make another premature commitment to this woman that you've just met, just fucked, that you barely know. You don't have to get rid of her. You don't have to not date her. But you don't want to rush out of one thing that wasn't the right thing and into another thing that might be closer to the right thing. But she could be the right sex, the right gender, the right partner, kind of, drawn from the right pool of partners for you going forward and still be not the right person or not one of the right people out there for you. You don't know enough about her yet. So... End your marriage would be my advice, as lovingly as you possibly can. Become independent, get your own place, stand on your own two feet. And if you want to date this woman, the instigating event, the causes busai, causes belli for ending your marriage, the eject button that you slammed your pussy down on, then go ahead, date her. Definitely date her. But don't run off with her. Don't compound the mistake of one premature commitment to a man by making another premature commitment to a woman. Hi, Dan. My current guy friend um, lives in a different state, so we do a lot of video sex and that kind of thing. And he has a, I don't know how severe, porn addiction. And his porn addiction comes from sexting with strangers on Snapchat. I don't enjoy this with the interactive part of it. But how do we watch porn together? Being in different locations and our alternative preference of porn. I've thought about offering hump up to him and seeing how that goes. I'm not sure if I have much advice for you, but I do have a couple of questions. How well do you know this guy? And do you feel that you can trust this guy? You say that you do uh, a lot of video sex with him. You also say that the kind of porn he enjoys most involves swapping sex messages with, I assume, strangers on Snapchat. Are you confident that he's not including the porn, the video you two are creating together or making together in these messages that he's swapping with people on Snapchat? Hopefully he's not acting maliciously. Hopefully he's not doing anything with the material you two generate, if indeed any that's being recorded, without your consent. If you're comfortable, if you're confident that he's not sharing anything that you don't want to be shared and you enjoy having video sex with this guy, go right ahead, have video sex with this guy. Why isn't that enough? Why do you also have to watch porn with him? And if he enjoys the kind of porn that you don't enjoy, the solution for that, the fix for that, usually 
in any kind of relationship, committed, casual, whether someone is your partner or just your dot, dot, dot guy, is to not watch porn together. It's fine for you to watch the porn that you enjoy. It's fine for him to watch the porn he enjoys. And for that to be something where you don't cross the streams, where you don't feel like you have to do that together. We don't feel like you have to be a part of every aspect of your partner's erotic inner life. This I think would fall into that place that some people have trouble with, which is the zone of erotic autonomy where your partner is able to have some erotic experiences or connections to these strangers that he snaps with on Snapchat that don't necessarily involve you. And so I'm a little concerned when you say that, you want to insert yourself into your partner's porn preferences that aren't your own. You don't share porn preferences. And rather than just letting him do his own thing on Snapchat, so long as he's not sharing anything that you don't want shared that involves you, you want to find something where you can come together about porn. And by implication, I, I infer that when you come together, if you can find some sort of porn that you both enjoy, then what? Then he'll stop snapping doing the Snapchat with the people that he's Snapchatting with now. Maybe that's not your intent here at all. Maybe there's just something about watching porn that you'd also like to do with him. But yeah, the kind of the way you talk about it, what I'm hearing are echoes of calls in the past from people who wanted to find a kind of porn that they could enjoy with their partner with the understanding that that then would shut down the kind of porn that their partner had been enjoying until they came along and I guess bigfooted porn or insisted that all sexual desire, all expressions of sexual desire, all fantasies, all masturbatory sessions must involve them too. I don't think that maybe, maybe that's not what you're saying, but if that is what you're saying, yeah, you need to step off, let your partner have this thing that you don't enjoy. And much as I love promoting Hump, HumpFilmFest.com, Hump currently touring North America, Hump in Europe, coming to Amsterdam and Munich soon. Go to HumpFilmFest.com slash Europe to find out more about Hump's European screenings. Hump isn't a replacement for the kind of porn that people enjoy when they're having a wank. Hump is porn, pornographic. It's fun. It can be sexy for people who are in a relationship Fuck buddies or otherwise are committed to watch Hump together, get some ideas, have some conversations, but it's not going to replace sexting with strangers on the internet if that's the kind of porn, swapping porn with strangers on the internet, if that's the kind of, if that's the way your partner enjoys porn. Hump isn't going to replace that. Maybe Hump is something that you and your partner can do together, but yeah, it's not going to shut the Snapchatting down. And I don't think that you should try. And if you don't want to hear about it, tell him you don't want to hear about it. If you don't want to think about it, tell him you don't want to hear about it so you don't have to think about it and you can pretend that that's not what he's doing. And circle back, double check, triple check, quadruple check that he isn't sharing anything that you're in if recordings are being made when you guys are having video sex together without your consent. Last week, I got a call from a woman who said she was super vanilla and wanted some ideas on spicing up her sex life. Well, I have a good idea where she might get some ideas. Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. At Dipsy, you can discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups. Dipsy is radically inclusive. Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of Dipsy's stories feature voice actors who are people of color. There are tons of vanilla stories and tons of really kinky stories, too. New content is released every week at Dipsy, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories that you can read. Let Dipsy... Be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, and yes, spice things up with a partner. For listeners of the Lovecast, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial 
when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash savage. Let them know the Lovecast sent you. Dipsystories.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm a divorced woman who just turned 50 from Canada. I was married for 25 years to a very controlling man, but am now in an amazing DS relationship with my partner of two years. I am his dom. We are open only on my side, except for when we play with males and threesomes. So threesomes. Here is where my question comes in. My partner recently came out as bi in the safety and openness of our relationship, and we both want him to explore this aspect of his sexuality more. But we are having such a hard time finding partners. We've only had three successful MMF threesomes in the last year and three non-starters where the men could just not get it up. But we have had countless almost encounters where we invest so much time and effort into chatting with someone, getting to the point of meeting them, and then, of course, get bailed on. Realistically, should it be this difficult to plan this sort of encounter? I will throw in two possible deterrents in that we do live in a suburb of Toronto, so about 45 minutes away from the city, and we can only play every other week since my partner has 50-50 custody of his kiddo. Then throw in the fact that there is not just disappointment every time an encounter doesn't happen, but some real emotional turmoil on my partner's part who feels like he let himself open this Pandora's box of sexual exploration only to seemingly have the universe tell him that he can never actually have it. To top it off, every time we get disappointed, a situation of tension and conflict arises between us because he starts to feel hurt and discouraged and wants to quit all of it. And I just want to get back on the horse and keep trying. Are we going about this the wrong way? Uh, I mean, we use apps like Field and AM. Should we stop pursuing this ostensibly impossible experience? Or should we just be patient and it will eventually happen again? That said, how long is too long? And do we keep putting ourselves out there. You've had three successful MMF threesomes in one year in a suburb of Toronto. That's a pretty good number of MMF threesomes in a single year. Even if you were looking for FFM threesomes, that's, that's pretty good. I don't understand why your husband is being such a baby about this. Yeah, okay, so you meet some guy on field and it feels like there's a spark and a possibility and then it it doesn't work out. Okay, that happens. Most things don't work out. You know, the internet is like a singles bar or a, a pickup joint. And you go to a singles bar, you go to a pickup joint, you make a lot of eye contact with a lot of people. Maybe you buy a drink or two for a handful of people. You don't get to go home with everybody you made eye contact with. It doesn't work out with everybody you bought a drink with. There's some churn and disappointment built into that system. You're getting to know these guys and then making a decision about whether you want to have a threesome with them. They're getting to know you two and then making their own decision about whether they want to get with you guys. And so, yeah, you're not going to bat a thousand. Seems to me that the mistake that you and your husband may be making is that you're investing too much time and energy before that first, that crucial first meeting to establish, you know, chemistry and physical attraction for you to see that they, these guys actually have sent you accurate and current photographs. And for these guys to see that you and your husband have sent them accurate and current photographs, you know, the law, you can really feel like you've created intimacy and a bond, just swapping text messages back and forth with someone that you haven't met. All right. Okay. Don't overinvest. Don't make too large an investment of time and energy before that first meeting. What you got to do, somebody approaches you on field or you approach someone on field and there is some initial interest Swap those photos, text back and forth, and then at some point say, hey, let's meet up and let's not burn through all the erotic energy now and spend ourselves, you know, just texting. So let's just put this on hold until we can arrange a meetup. 
and then meet. And then if it doesn't work out, you won't feel so, your husband won't feel so disappointed or jilted because he won't, you two together won't have made such a large investment. You know, your expectations, you want to pinned, you want to dick down all your hopes and dreams on this one particular guy. But I got to say, the suburban married couple and the burbs whose the husband just came out as bi and the wife's down to have had three MMF three ways in a single year. Doc, that's pretty great. You guys are doing great. That's a lot of dick. Add up the inches. I don't know how many inches are in total, but that's a lot of dick your husband's got in the last year. Thanks to you. Thanks to him lucking out, having the kind of wife who's up for it, who's psyched about her husband being bi, excited to have those MMF three ways. Not every guy who comes out as bi is so lucky. And maybe if he reminds himself that he's lucky, it'll help put these losses, you know, when he occasionally doesn't get that dick that he hoped to get, you two together didn't get that dick you were hoping to get, into perspective. I will say, though, you know, also something else to put it into perspective, MMF three ways tend to be, you know, everyone talks about unicorn hunters and all the straight couples out there seeking a bisexual woman. MMF three ways are sometimes a little harder to arrange. Often there are guys out there who will say that they're open to an MMF three-way when all they really want is the F, not the M, not the dick. And, you know, not every guy who's bi or down or open to it is out yet. How long did it take for your husband to come out? I think MMF three ways involve a higher degree of difficulty for a lot of people who might be interested in them, who are M's, who are males, who are men, because of internalized homophobia, because of whatever. And so, again, I'm just going to circle back. Three? Three that you enjoyed in a year? Well done. Bravo. Good for you. And if you click with one of those other guys, maybe ask about a regular thing. And in the meantime, until you find a couple of regular fuck buddy dudes who want to fuck you and your husband... Arrange that first meeting before your husband gets his hopes up or gets his hopes up too high about the next guy. And yeah, I think your husband should be just a little bit more grateful to the wife that he's got, to the universe for all the dick that he's been getting, and he should know, you should remind him, the internet's not going to run out of dick. There's a lot more dick out there for him to get. And you two working together, you're going to get so much. May is Mental Health Awareness Month and Talkspace, the leading virtual therapy provider, celebrates every effort you make to improve how you feel and how you live. Even a small step can make a big difference. If you've been working on your mental health or if you want to make progress toward a mentally healthier place, Talkspace is here for you. You think seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist would be helpful, but you don't have the time to actually find one and meet with them or you feel like you can't afford one, try Talkspace. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy, accessible, and affordable. You can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. With Talkspace, there's no need to commute to an appointment. You don't have to miss time or take time off at work. You don't have to line up childcare in order to attend your sessions. It's the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationship issues, and much more. Talkspace is secure and private using the latest end-to-end bank-grade encryption technology to store client information and complying with the latest HIPAA regulations. Finally, Talkspace is affordable and in-network with most major insurers. To celebrate May, which again is Mental Health Awareness Month, and to celebrate every step you take towards a better, richer, and fuller life, Talkspace is offering every listener of this podcast $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash savage to get $100 off your first month. And this is where I would usually say... Be sure to use the promo code to show your support for the show. But you know what? Going to Talkspace.com is a great way to show support for yourself. Talkspace.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I have a weird question about 
uh, exercise induced orgasms. So I've never had one of these before. And then the other day I had one at the gym uh, on the seated calf raise machine came out of nowhere. I climaxed. I, I got off the machine. I went to the bathroom, wiped, you know, all that and like got back on the machine to do my next set. And it happened again. And today, when I got on the machine, it happened with each set. I don't know if there's something different about how I'm positioning my hips. I definitely feel with each rep that the area of my, like, vagina, labia, vulva, clit is being, like, squeezed and, like, kind of pushed down against the seat that I'm on. And it just sort of continues until I freaking climax. And I don't, I, it's kind of awkward and embarrassing. And I don't love, I mean, it's nice to come. I love coming, but like, I don't know that I want to be coming at the gym in public in front of people. I'm keeping it real down low, of course. But like, I just want to know, has anyone ever experienced this? What can I do about it? I've tried positioning my hips in different ways. It seems like, I don't know, I broke my brain, my body, and now this is just a thing that happens every time. I'm either going to have really, really amazing calves or no calves at all, depending on how I feel about what's going on here. Joining me to help tackle this question, Dr. Debbie Herbenick, frequent Savage Lovecast guest expert, professor at the Indiana University School of Public Health, director of the Center for Sexual Health, promotion, author, researcher, sex writer, author in particular, and relevant to this caller's question of the Corgasm Workout. Dr. Herbenick, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. So is this a thing that happens? It is. Um, it is. So exercise-induced orgasm has happened at least once to about 10% of Americans. And it's so it's, it's a lot more common than people realize. Uh, but it's something that many people don't talk about. You'd think people would talk about it more if only to incentivize exercise. Is it a thing that happens to men, though? When I hear orgasms talked about, exercise-induced orgasms, it's almost always women who suddenly have this experience or are talking about this experience. Does it happen to men? It does happen to men. So when we did our first study on it more than a decade ago, we only had information about women. And we put it out into the world, you know, it came out and it got a lot of press attention. And then I started hearing from all kinds of men. So in the Corgasm Workout book, we do include men's stories, which are fascinating. Um, when it happens to men, I think the most interesting thing about it is they rarely ever get an erection. It usually goes straight to ejaculation. So um, exercise orgasm is trickier for many men um, or anyone with a penis because um, it does have the potential for more embarrassment, more public attention, and and so it's trickier. It makes more of a mess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the calf machine, is this a particular site of these sudden exercise-induced orgasms? You know, the calf machine is not one of the most common, common um, exercises that one would get it from. It's more often exercises like um, the Roman chair where people do hanging leg raises or um, sort of uh, supported leg raises, pull-ups, chin-ups, things like that. But there are a number of sort of strength machines like seated leg presses and others. So I'm not surprised to hear about the calf machine. Generally, if you're kind of um, engaged and your core is engaged and like really engaged and something is taxing your core abdominal muscles, that's when we are most likely to see exercise-induced um, orgasms happen. So is it a case where there's just some nerve that's getting plucked or twanged that's usually only engaged during sex, that there's just suddenly this kind of wire crossing that could result in these orgasms for men and women? Maybe. We don't know. There are a number of people who will talk about if they're really in tune with their body, will notice some, you know, I think many of us who work out know the sense of like where our muscles start to quiver, right? We've worked them out so hard, they start to kind of quiver. And so some people will see that as um, something that happens just before they um, they go into their exercise and just orgasm or their orgasm, And others don't. I think in this woman's case, you know, she really doesn't necessarily want to have this experience or she wants to be able to at least maybe have some control or insight over it. And, and that's tricky. So, you know, for anyone who doesn't want this to happen and some people don't, they do need to kind of listen to their body. I know that that's a phrase, right? Listen to your body, but, but it will give you generally like almost everybody has a pattern that they can notice. 
And if you can back that pattern up and then kind of, you know, stop that, as she, as she kind of says, right, she's either going to have the most amazing calves or like no calves at all. Um, <laughs> and so, and, and that is true, but I have worked with a lot of people who once we kind of figure out their pattern, we can find ways to adjust it if they don't want to have it. Other people are like, this is my super secret and I get to have this experience and it's so much fun and I love it. So this is happening for 10% roughly of people and there's not a, an enormous mountain of data about this, but let's say potentially 10% of people at the gym all around you, one out of 10 could be climaxing during their workouts and you would never know. I mean, maybe even more than 10% if you look at a gym population because it's people working out. But I've talked with like elite athletes, professional athletes, folks in the military, like people who are really active and, and it's great for some people and it's really challenging for others, again, especially if you have penile ejaculation. This caller says that she feels embarrassed. There's nothing for her to feel embarrassed about. If she's able to work those calves out, have those orgasms, enjoy them without unnerving the people around her. If she's not a screamer, if she's not shuddering, there's nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about here. She can secretly, like every, I, I talk about secret perving all the time in all sorts of different contexts. If she's going to secretly perv on the calf machine and no one's the wiser, she should just enjoy this. Yeah, if this is a bodily, it's like a bodily reflex, right? It's what, I mean, like you can't stop yourself from sweating at the gym. And there are some people who can't stop themselves from having an orgasm or can't easily, or they want to have that exercise, right? They want to do that thing. So if it's not bothering anyone, you're not making other people uncomfortable. Again, many people just have to like readjust their way of thinking and say, this is just how my body works. And I'm not doing anything bad or shameful or wrong about it, you know, but if she doesn't want it to happen, then she just is going to have to kind of listen to her body and back it off. And for some people that even means like, so sometimes it's not doing an exercise, doing less of it. Um, for other people, it's not doing cardio right before it, especially with weight machines. But if she's having fun, generally, if she can get past, like sort of give herself a break, many, many people say that this is just a nice perk of their workouts. Dr. Debbie Herbenick, professor at the Indiana University School of Public Health and director of the Center for Sexual Health Promotion, author of The Corgasm Workout, Because It Feels Good, Great in Bed, Sex Made Easy, and the genius big brain behind so much terrific sex research that's really informed conversations about sex all over the world, all over the internet, all over this program for decades. Dr. Herbenek, thank you so much for coming on the show and taking another call with me. Thank you. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is sponsored by Stamps.com. Let's hear it for the small businesses out there. It seems like everything these days is getting gobbled up by giant chains if you're out there running your own small business, you are making the world a more interesting place. And I, and I think my listeners, we all appreciate you. Stamps.com gets it because for the last 25 years, they've been helping businesses like yours save time and money. So you can focus on your business knowing Stamps.com has all your postage needs covered with premium discounts and great rates. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. If you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com will seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Running a business isn't cheap, especially when it comes to fulfilling orders for your customers. Luckily, Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts, up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right now from your computer anytime, day or night. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with the promo code SAVAGE for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter promo code SAVAGE. Hi, Dan. My aunt recently came out of the closet and she is married to my uncle and they have a child together. The family is really supportive and my aunt and my uncle have asked for privacy, but my aunt is sharing a lot of details about 
her new girlfriend and her new relationship. She's sharing a lot of stuff stating that she's an out and proud lesbian, which is awesome. That's great for her. I'm really excited for her. But it is uncomfortable because she's still married to my uncle and my uncle is still acting as though they're married. I'm not sure if they're in an open relationship. They've asked everyone not to pry because they don't have answers yet, but it's putting the rest of the family in a really weird position because we know that my aunt is dating somebody else. My aunt really public on social media where the whole family can see that she's a lesbian and that she has a girlfriend and we want to be excited for her, but it's raising a lot of questions. It's also put us in a weird spot because my uncle has had some pretty serious health issues and we want to make sure that someone is home with him when he gets back from the hospital. And when we've asked about whether or not my aunt was going to be there, we were told it's not any of our business. And then later we found out that she spent the weekend out of state with her new girlfriend. The family would have liked to be there for my uncle if we had known, but it seems to be that's something that they don't want to talk about because of this new relationship. How can we support my aunt in her coming out journey and also make sure that my uncle is safe and being taken care of and also respected by his still wife through this process? I don't know what you can do to ensure that your uncle is being respected by his wife during her coming out process. I do know, though, that you and the rest of the extended family have to respect what sounds like your uncle's expressed wishes here, which is for no one to interfere or to insert themselves into their lives at this moment. Maybe your uncle is embarrassed. Maybe your uncle's wife, maybe your aunt's new girlfriend has friends who are looking after you. You don't know what's going on in their relationship or what's going on in their marriage. And if they don't want you to know and they don't want you helping Oh, you can't exactly kick down the front door at that moment. Yeah, it sounds dicey. If your uncle was home alone after coming home from the hospital, that's not good. Your family. Now, in my family, anybody could drop by the house at any time for any reason. Other families are a little bit more formal and distant. What's normal in your family? If you're worried about your uncle, and there are people who live, family that lives nearby. Can you swing by? Can you knock on the front door? Can you check in? In my family, you could. In your family, maybe you can't. If you fear that your uncle is being neglected, and it sounds like he might be being neglected at this moment, and you're willing to risk the wrath of your aunt, who is on her coming out journey, which sounds a little bit like Maybe a myopic, selfish, self-centered, coming out assholery as much as coming out journey, which sometimes happens when people come out. They become selfish, tunnel vision, 15-year-olds again. Maybe that's what's going on here. If you're willing to risk their wrath, drop by and check in with your uncle. He's your relative too. Yeah, go ahead and drop by, even if it risks pissing your aunt off and possibly pissing your uncle off. But if your uncle is being isolated right now by his wife, isolated from the kind of support that ideally he would get from his spouse, but also the kind of support that he and his spouse might call on during a health crisis, you know, we can't do these things for our partners all by ourselves, that it takes a village shit just ain't for infants and toddlers and small children and the whole village pitching in to help raise them. But, you know, for adults who are having a health crisis and their partners and caregivers who may need backup and that your aunt isn't seeking backup and that your uncle isn't asking for help. Maybe that means that they don't need it. Maybe they've already got it. Maybe they have chosen family and friends that they're more comfortable getting this kind of help from than they are from family. I don't know what your uncle's history is with your family, but go check, go double check, go drop in and have face-to-face conversation with your uncle and make eye contact and ask him what help he needs, if any. And at that moment, you'll be able to get a a read on the house, on what shape it's in and whether there's any food in the kitchen. Yeah. Swing in. Doesn't sound like intervention is needed, but checking in, checking in, I think under the circumstances definitely called for. 
All right, before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to read a couple of comments from the last few shows posted at savage.love. Neo pronouns came up during my recent conversation with comedian May Martin. Neither May nor I were huge fans, says Lazy Femme. Neo pronouns simply refer to third person pronouns other than he, she, they, one, and it. You advocated for the use of neo pronouns yourself once, Dan, before embracing the singular they you once suggested per, per, per self. The people on the internet who identify as non-human things are not representative of neo-pronoun users. Lazy Femme continues, people who use neo-pronouns such as bun, buns, bun self, and those are called noun self pronouns, and I've never seen those used outside of the internet. All right, Lazy Femme, I've never encountered neo-pronouns in the wild either, but I gotta say, just reading about them, and the New York Times did a huge piece on them, induces a sort of anxiety, not because anyone has to use them, but because you can't help feeling, particularly if you're queer, like they're going to be on the final. And if everyone should wind up adopting neo-pronouns, that is going to be a lot to memorize. And Vshant says, in response to the vanilla couple that wanted to spice things up, I was expecting you to suggest they do a yes, no, maybe list, Dan. I've found that it's really helped me get the discussion going with my partners, helping us better understand what we're into, open to, interested in, and what's off the table. I've never heard you mention them, Dan, so I'm wondering if you feel they are problematic in some way. Actually, I have no problem with yes, no, maybe lists, which is just another way and a pretty good way for people to get a conversation started, which is, of course, another way of saying a good way for people to use their words. Thanks to everybody who left a comment on the show at savage.love. And thanks to everybody who posted about the show to your social media accounts this week. We really appreciate how Savage Lovecast listeners help spread the word about the Lovecast. Now something else we also really appreciate, listener response calls. Hey, Dan. This is a response to the guy in episode 863 with the super intense sounding wild edging play with him and his partner and then with a series of really intense headaches afterward. I don't want to be alarmist because what he's doing sounds really wonderful, but I am a medical provider who specializes in neurologic issues. And what he's describing sounds like a pretty classic postcoital headache, which can be a result of a spontaneous bleed in the brain. They're usually not due to ruptured aneurysms in the brain, but they are pretty serious. And the way he described his headache is pretty textbook. I hope he's okay. And I definitely hope that he can get some medical attention, especially if he experiences a similar pattern of headaches that are super duper intense, especially that neck pain and stiffness he was having after the fact had me a little concerned. Hey, Dan. I have a response to the woman in the vanilla heterosexual relationship. Everything that you suggested was fine, but one of the things that I would actually throw in there, something that's relatively tame, is role play. So you have the same partner for a long period of time. Spice it up by actually picking out different roles and go and meet in a situation where you can view each other as like a new flirtation. This means that, you know, you can go to a bar, you can go to a restaurant, you can go out dancing, and you pretend to be this new persona where you can even spice up your wardrobe. She can put on different kind of makeup and style her hair a little bit differently. Literally try on new shoes and then engage with your long-term partner in a way that is completely new and surprising to them. Felt like that was um, something that was really, really approachable for someone who is not into kink and may not be comfortable with the fact that, you know, if you show up at your partner's work for sex, they could be really put off by being caught having sex in a more public place. And we're going to leave it there. Got a question for next week's Lovecast? You can go to savage.love slash askdan to record your question or comment. Or you can use the voice memo app on your phone and email your question or comment to q at savage.love. Or you can call us and leave a message at 206-302-2064. Tomorrow, Wednesday, May 10th, I am hosting Savage Love Live, a live Zoom show with Nancy and the tech-savvy at-risk youth exclusively for Savage Lovecast Magnum subscribers. 
listeners. We'll be recording questions and answers during Savage Love Live for an upcoming Lovecast. So get those cues in and brace for my A's. Links for Savage Love Live will be sent out to subs tomorrow morning and posted at savage.love. Subscribe now at savage.love and you can come to the show. Speaking of shows, Missoula, Cleveland, Nashville, Montreal, you are up next. The Hump 2023 Film Festival is coming to a theater near you. Go to humpfilmfest.com for venues, dates, and tickets to the world's best indie porn short film festival. And if you're in Amsterdam or Munich, the best of Hump is coming to you. Go to humpfilmfest.com slash Europe for venues, dates, and tickets. Follow me on Instagram at Dan Savage. Follow me on Twitter, yes, still at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Dr. Debbie Herbenick on Twitter at Debbie Herbenick. Jolenta Greenberg is on Twitter at Jolenta G. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian. And I'm off to go get my surgery. Will we be skipping a show next week? Will I be taking a week off? No. So me and Nancy and the tech savvy at risk youth, we will all be back at you next week with a brand new Savage Lovecast. Thank you for downloading.